thank you to myself as I drink thank some high tea. <laughs> thank you, hands, for thank passing you. on the juice box to my mouth. Beautiful hands for all you do for me, including <laughs> touch my face, even though I'm not allowed to do that anymore. Even though we like super shouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, I guess we're already recording, so this is our intro. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Where I'm just saying, thank you, Hands, for bringing the juice box <laughs> to my lips. Uh, well, thank you, Hands, for bringing some booze to my mouth, even though it's only 3.30, but that's okay. I need it. So, Listen, how are you? It's, it's 3.30 in, like, whatever the real world used to be. But that's one day, they, we should just break all the clocks during quarantine, because what the hell is time? You know? Yeah, the, the other day you said something to me like, oh, well... Are you thinking Friday or Saturday or something like that? And I was like, <laughs> I literally don't know. Like, I have no concept of either one. So just pick. Like, isn't today Friday yeah. and Saturday? What day Wait, is I'm it? Confused. Time is a construct. <laughs> I know it. Well, I, uh, yep, that's pretty much it. I was just going to tell you another example. The of these, end. <laughs> the exact same thing. Well, we have exciting news. Okay. Yes. Our birthdays were coming up and we were like, well, we're Geminis, as everyone has been calling out that meme that says a group of Geminis is called a podcast, which, yeah, I mean, they're not wrong. Uh, and we were like, what do we do? Our birthdays are coming up. We want to do something special. And so we've decided to – do you want to announce it, Em? Yes. Also, by the way, I do want to say I like how we were like, I don't remember days anymore. Yeah, or like we remember re one, two days. Remember <laughs> this specific day. So obviously our birthday is June 3rd and June 4th and we don't get to see each other. So we were like, how do we do something together? But with you guys yes. too. So the day after our birthday is June 5th, we are going to be doing our very first live digital show. Yes. Where we, it's a benefit show. So all the proceeds are going to go to COVID relief. Um, I uh, believe to the Coalition for the Homeless. National Co Coalition for the Homeless is the, mm -hmm. um, the uh, beneficiary of our cool show. And so uh, we don't – I basically, it's going to not be our actual um, – our current Here for the Booze tour. That is not what this is. So if you are – Because we can't do that over Zoom, unfortunately. We can't. And if you plan on – like if you already have tickets to the Here for the Booze tour, you are not seeing oh, it now. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? This yeah, is we're not the, spoiling anything for the real tour. No, no, no. This is uh, kind of like our, our old school original tour where we're just – we're doing – live show notes and so yeah. but we're going to be live on zoom with whoever wants to come it's going to be ten dollar tickets as your donation and um it's going to be june 5th 5 pacific standard time 8 eastern standard time and oh my gosh i'm so excited it's, it's gonna we don't know how many people we can do yet right it's going to be like a certain amount of several hundred yeah we're people. trying to figure out with zoom how um well eva is <laughs> trying to figure out with zoom how many people we can fit and so basically once people start i guess buying tickets we'll figure out kind of where we stand um right as far as like a limit if there is one but yeah so we're gonna do it's basically like a live episode um and it's a birthday bash and uh birthday bash. yeah and a and a i don't know covid relief fun benefit <laughs> it's a lot of things a birthday benefit bash oh um there it is triple b triple b the triple b anyway uh, it will be it'll be june 5th and um hopefully you can make it it's a friday and it'll be dinner time roughly at least in america across the board so yeah and um we're gonna i'm gonna be drinking we're gonna be having fun and um, I don't think we're going to share it afterward because we want it to just be like a special live show. So if you want to see it, um, come join us. And I mean, it's I guess still, we don't have the ticket link yet, but we'll we'll get that. We'll post that on our socials as soon as we have it. Yeah. And this this comes out with only like a week and a half left. So oh, I think <laughs> by the time by the time we've announced this, it'll it probably be already be up. You're so. right. You're right. But just a reminder, if you're thinking about it, you only have like a week or so left. So just, Ooh. you know. Anyway, very excited. That's our big, big news. I also have a little bit of news, which I'm really excited about, is that I was um, actually able to guest on Morbid this week. And I was so excited because um, a lot of you know that M was on last week and it was a great episode. Um, and I, a lot of people were like, well, when's Christine going on? And I was like, well, I can't tell you, I don't think, cause I don't want to spoil their show. So <laughs> right. I just didn't say anything, but I was on and it was super fun. And the theme was like twisty, turny stories. So, um, the stories I shared had like a, a surprise twist ending. Um, and so that's out now too. So check out Morbid. They're our new pals and we really like them. 
and they are just as nice as you imagine they, they are, are. when you listen really to the show lovely. you're like i bet they're great people they're fucking delights they are so. and they also are in boston which is like our semi hometown our honor i like to think hometown. of them as our our love children no oh, our yeah. love partners and don't crime? say no say yes i'm in they are our love children okay <laughs> they don't know it yet but <laughs> hopefully okay. someone someone lets them know um oh. but yes i i'm very excited to listen to your episode okay. and you also um what was i gonna say i don't remember what is going on with me was I'm it scared. about paranormal captivity no no oh. i ass- <laughs> Well, that's it's coming not, out it is soon. Now. That's it not out now. yet. <laughs> M was on recently, um, but I'm our my episode has not come out yet. I hope Eva doesn't mind that I've spoiled that. Um, but it's coming out in a few weeks, so stay tuned because that one was also super fun, right? Um, but yeah, meow. right? Meow. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. No, you're not. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's it. Do you have any updates? Oh, I have an update that nobody cares about, but I am the one with the microphone. So fantastic. Uh, I, as of the end of this week, will have finished, not finished. I'll have finished a chunk of my Pokemon collection. Of what's what? Least, what defines a chunk? Well, so it's like the a fraction of them. I'm currently trying to collect four different decks and. It's very comp. I've made it complicated because I'm me, but sure. So basically, I at the end of this week, I'll at least have all of the cards from one of the decks. But then that's just like the first step of it, and then I want to start trading them for better quality cards. Oh, so but I'll at least have like the first. I mean, I they're all like pretty good quality. I like didn't want to start with like crap cards, so right. they're all uh, at least pretty good, like near mint. But I want to start trading them out for better quality for so. mint. Ooh. I know. Anyway, that's my that's my update. But I think a lot of people care about that, actually. Like, I really do. A lot of people are very big Pokemon folks. I'm surprised how many people on like Instagram Live and things like that ask me about my Pokemon collection. And some well, people have asked you care so much, and it's important know, to you. It's so sweet. I but I, I, a lot of people have asked me to eventually like show them, <laughs> you like uh, like show them in my binder. Oh, you should do like a live or something. Okay, Instagram Live probably will. I'll watch anyway. that. I'm interested to see it. Um. Anyway, that's very exciting. Uh, I have not do not have any exciting news like that on my end, so I'm sorry. I have no collection to let you know about. That's fine. I'm here for the two of us. Yay. Women don't often talk about thinning hair unless you're me, then I talk about it a lot. But nearly half of all women experience it by as early as age 40. If you're one of them like I am, you know it can feel scary and stressful, which only adds to the problem. But Nutrafol is formulated with potent botanic- botanicals? Yes. botanicals to help you grow hair as strong as you are, and it's physician formulated to be 100% drug-free. On top of <laughs> thicker, stronger hair without lasers or chemicals, Nutrafol's ingredients may also help you get a handle on better sleep, stress, skin, nails, and libido. And when oh. you subscribe, <laughs> listen, <laughs> when you subscribe, you'll receive <laughs> monthly deliveries so you never miss a dose, and shipping is free, and you can pause or cancel anytime. Visit Nutrafol.com and take their hair wellness quiz for customized product recommendations that put the power to grow thicker, stronger hair back into your hands. And 77% of women saw improvements in just 90 days. I've been taking it for a couple months now, and I can actually tell you that I know Em likes to make fun of my bald spot, but- um, It's not there anymore. It's, Where is it's, it? I actually have been growing hair. Like, you can see all the little ones here. It's I working. I miss him. It's working. I know you miss it a lot, but <laughs> I don't. So I'm really thankful for Nutrafol. Um, you can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and using promo code DRINK to get 20% off. This is their best offer available anywhere. Plus free shipping on every order. Get 20% off at Nutrafol.com, promo code DRINK. Their best offer anywhere. It's 20% off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code DRINK. Their best offer anywhere, 20% off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code DRINK, for hair as strong as you are. What if I told you, Em, that you could get high-quality organic and non-GMO groceries delivered to your door for a lot less than you're paying now and help our and help out families in need? I would say... That's bananas. (laughs) Well, that's actually what I'm doing because I discovered Thrive Market and as a and as a proud Thrive Market member, I get the products I love and my paid membership provides a free one for someone in need like a low income family teacher veteran or first responder. 
Thrive Market tailors to over 70 different diets and values like paleo to keto to plant-based, delivering the highest quality organic and non-GMO food. And they also offer clean beauty and bath products, uh, pet staples, pet staples. Mm-hmm. Oh, like food, like, deli- mm-hmm. like delicious, like- t- delicious, tasty steaks and, and things like that. No. Okay. And non-toxic cleaning products, plus ethical meat, sustainable seafood, clean wine, and more. Clean wine. Oh, trust me. I've been using Thrive for a couple years now, and I was so excited when I saw this sponsor come in because I love Thrive. I buy wine there. I buy Gio and Juni's uh, snacks and actual daily food there. Um, And it's really cool because you get discounts on pretty much every order, and you're also helping people in need. So it's just – and they have so many products. Like I buy my bath stuff, my pet stuff wine, dinner, lunch, everything. Well, okay. So one of the things I love about them is their cleaning products. They all smell very good. <laughs> I do. know that's, it's such a specific thing, but it's the, the one thing I it's love important. the most about them. And as a member, you're saving 25 to 50% off of traditional retail prices and their carbon neutral shipping is free on orders over $49. In addition to membership matching, Thrive Market is matching donations to their COVID-19 relief fund dollar for dollar. Again, bananas. Yep. Th- Thrive Market is working 24-7 to make sure members are getting their groceries delivered as fast as possible. You can learn more about their commitments to customers and membership matching on their website. Try Thrive Market and become a member risk-free. Go to thrivemarket.com slash drink. Join today and you'll get up to $20 in shopping credit, uh, shopping credit toward your first order. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash drink to start your risk-free membership and get up to $20 toward your first order. That's thrivemarket.com slash drink. Um, so my story, just jumping into it, uh, last week was Harry Price, the original ghost hunter. Yes. And I told you guys, so this is actually kind of, I think, my first three-parter. Oh, yeah. That- I don't think you've, or what was the, oh, wait, no. What was this time travel? I did travel? a three-parter, right? I think that was a two-parter. Oh, maybe. Yeah, okay, then maybe it is. If I haven't done one before, this is the first. So, um, That's generally how that works. <laughs> it's got to start somewhere. <laughs> um, but so I did Harry Price, and I told you guys last week that I was going to be covering two individual cases that he worked on that, like, I just – the notes were already so long last week, I knew I couldn't get through those two cases and do justice on them. Um, so I told you about uh, the seance of Rosalie, which I actually ended up pushing to next week because I ended up finding a lot about this case. And so this one has also been widely requested across Twitter and my Instagram DMs um, for a while now. But this is the case of Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Oh, shit. I'm so <laughs> excited. This is one of those weird ones that I feel like lives in the back of my subconscious and I don't have any clue what it is, but I need to know more. Well, I also, I actually, after this, also want to learn more because there's a lot of really good podcasts, like well-known podcasts that cover this in depth, and I just didn't get to listen to them. So this is without any of that knowledge. Okay. Um, But this is just what Google could provide. So um, so Jeff the Talking Mongoose is also known as the Dalby Spook because it was in an area called Dalby. Um, So this was in 1931. And Harry Price doesn't get mentioned too much in this, but he does make his little appearance because, like I said last week, this we're now in the paranormal cinematic universe. Um, so we'll get there. So in 1931, in a village called Cashin's Gap, which is apparently near Dalby. Um, what it's country on the, are we in? So this is the British Isles. So this okay. is the, the Isle of Man. Okay. This is what it's called. Um, and... We're at a remote farmhouse away from everybody. Nice. And I love, love a good remote farmhouse We're on the gonna British Isles. probably get murdered there, but that's okay. <laughs> so uh, there was a family of three. This was the Irving family. So their names were James, Margaret, and then they had a 13-year-old daughter named Voiry. Okay. I had not heard that name before. Me neither. Maybe it's a British Isles name. Sure. Um, but it's V-O-I-R-R-E-Y. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so also in my frantic notes, I interchange James with Jimmy. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> every now and then I'm like, what's Jimmy up to? Sometimes we're a little more casual with him. It does. I mean, Jimothy is the real <laughs> appropriate. May name. I call you Jimothy? <laughs> you may. So uh, James had been a wealthy businessman. I saw in one source that he was like a piano salesman. Oh, okay. Um, but then apparently that 
tanked. And so he ended up uh, taking up farming. So that's why they moved to the farmhouse and his family was struggling. Cause I guess the area, I don't know anything about this area, but apparently it's super, super remote. Like they don't know anybody and you couldn't, if you wanted to, cause there was nobody there. Um, so they were basically in extreme isolation and they were struggling a lot. They were, I guess an older couple and they also didn't have electricity or a phone. So they really were just by themselves in this house. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. And that comes back later. This is definitely like a murder. It sounds like a murder story. Like, why would you move somewhere where you will probably get murdered when well, you're what? more likely to <laughs> than not? You what know? year was this? 1931. Oh, okay. I was like, elect no electricity. Okay, that makes a little more sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Uh, so one night they're having dinner and all of a sudden they hear this scratching and growling behind one of their wall panels. Yeah, told you. What did I tell you? It's actually Christine in the wall ready to <laughs> tell you that you're going to get killed. But also I'm like, help, I'm stuck. I don't know how I got so lost, but I How did, did I get to the British Isles and also <laughs> why am I inside your wall? I would take a wrong turn and end up in the fucking Isle of Man by Remember accident. Remember that time you left me in Canada? <laughs> You were like, okay, bye. I, you, you guys, I like. I know we've mentioned this before, but like, I literally one time abandoned Em and Eva in Canada, like in the country, and I left the country without them. I am like, uh, of, of all places, like, thank God that that's where I wanted. I know, left. I know. But at the same time, like, we got to the airport, and Chris, I don't forget what the issue was, but all of a sudden, Christine was like, "Well, I have to go now," and I was like. <laughs> I was it like, was so bad. I was like crying. It was not just that casual. I definitely like we got to the airport late because of me because I didn't realize we had to get there two and a half hours early or they wouldn't let us board. And um, since we had all this luggage, they said, yeah, you can board, but you can't bring any luggage. And we were like, well, we need to bring our luggage. And then they were like, OK, well, one of you can board now or two of you can board now and the last person can stay with the luggage. And Eva's like, I'll stay with the luggage. And then Em was like, no, I'll stay with you. And I was meeting Blaze. I was not going to leave our no, I know. in Canada. I know. And the only reason I went on the plane, I wouldn't have otherwise, is because Blaze had already gotten to Portland and we were meeting there that morning. And I had like <laughs> all the Airbnb information. And so he was like, I'm here. And I was like, well, I have to go meet Blaze, otherwise I'll be six hours late. And so I, I felt I remember just like being so fucking tired because it was like six in the morning. Yeah. And I remember hearing like, well, one of you has to stay. And I remember seeing like the slow turn. I of literally turned like like two point oh two miles an hour back to you. I was <laughs> horrified. Like, Are you in? And, I was like, and then well, I just like handed you guys my luggage and was like, okay, see you in another. I think country. your last words were like. I won't be surprised if you throw my luggage away. <laughs> yeah, I, truly. And I wouldn't have blamed you for one second. Um, I had a blast. By the way, that if I were to get stuck in an airport, like that specific airport, let alone Canada, but that was a massive fucking airport. And they had every Canadian tchotchke store I could ever want. So I had a great time. Eva bought me Starbucks. I know. I know. And then I got jealous, which is the worst part, because I'm like, I just turned them in another country. And then I look, and they're like having a ball. And I'm like, oh, I wish I were there. And then I was like, wait, no, I don't. I just abandoned them there. I'm sorry. Well, that was like such a – but like truly, this is exactly the reason I would end up in a foreign country by accident, because I lo got lost on the way to Kroger. Like that's typically <laughs> how I end up in these bad scenarios. So, Well, anyway. if we ever end up in the British Isles and all of a sudden there's like only one seat out of there, I'm going to slowly turn to you and be like, you fucking owe me. <laughs> you can stay in that fucking cabin, Christine, and get murdered. You owe me. So uh, – oh, yeah. So we're back at Christine being in the walls. So yeah. they heard the scratching and growling behind the wall panel and they thought it was a small animal not christine yeah definitely not a small animal and so james he uh tried to growl at it and bang on the walls to try to scare it out thinking it was maybe a rat or something but it growled back Ugh. as loudly as he did so oh, no so the noises apparently never stopped and it just slowly continued and slowly got worse and it ended up not just being random growls it became like a range of animal sounds that could also imitate him. So if he made a sound, it could like parrot what he was doing. No Ew. pun intended. But he, um, then it got to a point where he was, he realized he was teaching this thing how to imitate to a point where he could later on just say the name of like a random bird and it would know the bird call. What? And, like, re and like recall the bird call. And it was and still imitate. in the wall? 
It was still on the wall, like not eating, like the F just hanging out, just doing bird calls, which by the way, is the most like dad thing. Like I'm going to go live in a far off remote area and teach something on my walls, random bird calls. Yeah. Cause why not? For all our sakes, we need to avoid crowds any way we can right now. But what if you need to go to the post office? What if you need postage to send out letters and packages? Do not worry. Do not fret. Because stamps.com is here to help. Yay. I've been using stamps.com. I just got to say it ev- like every week since um, this social distancing started because I've been mailing, I've been like cl- declaring my house and selling stuff on different apps and websites. And I can just print the labels from my house. I mean, we'll tell you all about it, but I just got to say, I freaking love stamps.com and they have saved my butt. I don't have to go to the post office anymore, which is a lifesaver. So with stamps.com, you can print postage on demand and skip those lines and crowds at the post office. Plus you can actually save money with discounts that you can't even get at the post office. And is that, And as if that weren't enough, Stamps.com also offers UPS services now with discounts up to 60% and no UPS residential surcharges. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send it. Once your mail is ready, just leave it with your mail carrier, schedule a free package pickup, or drop it in the mailbox. No human contact required, the way I've always wanted it. (laughs) And it's just that simple. And like we said, with Stamps.com, you get great discounts too. Five cents off every first class stamp and up to 62% off shipping rates. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, especially now, saving you time and money and keeping you safe in these crazy times. Right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in drink. That's Stamps.com. Enter drink. Stay safe, my friends. All right. So then he slowly moved from just animal noises to like starting to uh, sing like nursery rhymes and he was like maybe i can get to like hum the nursery rhymes but then he slowly started noticing that instead of animal noises it was changing into baby cooing noises oh oh god almost as if it was learning how to speak to imitate the nursery rhymes it just got like goosebumps i don't even know why goose cam oh get it mongoose cam holy (gasps) shit hang on on. (laughs) wait a minute that's the graphic of this episode mongoose cam Wait a minute. Get out of here. Every episode from now on is going to be called that because I'll never come up with something so clever (laughs) again for the rest of my life. Uh, Well, I'm glad you found your calling finally. My one one very sad calling. Yes. Thank you. So soon the family, uh, so they were hearing baby noises and then eventually the Irving family, quote, her definite words issuing from the walls. No, thank you. And soon it was able to not just hum the nursery rhymes that James had been kind of teaching it, but it was singing them, like repeating the nursery rhymes. (laughs) So imagine though, like ring around the rosy, like that's, I told you, this is like a horror cabin. If it's like a bar trick, I would at least bring the landlord in to be like, (laughs) this is why I'm leaving. Like I have (laughs) concrete evidence for why I should not be here anymore. (laughs) The landlord in the remote 1930s. Yeah, the landlord. For this cabin. Yeah, he has like a whole (laughs) condo complex of these. But so uh, this was a quote from Jim about the voices uh, or about this creature that was now speaking. Uh, Quote, it announces its presence by calling either myself or my wife by by our Christian names. Oh, no. And its hearing powers are phenomenal. Uh, It is no use whispering in our house. It detects the whisper 15 to 20 feet away tells you that you're whispering and repeats exactly what you said. Ew. So it can hear everything. And now it's moved on from nursery rhymes to literally just talking like to you. you. Yeah. Um, and soon this thing could speak fluently no. and introduced himself as Jeff. What? <laughs> so it just learned the name Jeff. Like nobody taught it that name. It just like it, came up it with it. It clearly didn't know how to spell it though because it was G-E-F. Oh, wait, that's really cute. <laughs> it's kind of like how, like, when you go to Disneyland and, like, Pluto spells his name with, like, a backwards P yeah, or something. it's kind of precious in, like, the creepiest way imaginable. <laughs> anyway, he says his name is Jeff. Apparently, he's an 80-year-old mongoose from Delhi, India. What the? And he's a Gemini. See, that explains, that literally ex- Did he say that he was a Gemini? He was born June 7th, 1852. Um, that's literally that explains so much 
I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I kind of relate to Jeff. I understand Jeff. There's a reason we both, like, really uh, strongly gravitate toward Jeff, I think. Yeah. I, and also, like, it's fucking Gemini season, or at least when this comes out, it's about to be Gemini season. So we're on the cusp, and Jeff is fucking ready to party. So (laughs) he's been ready for 80 years. (laughs) (laughs) So my first thought was, how the hell did he get here from India? Correct. And apparently, he says he was hunted and he ended up escaping straight to the British Isles. That's how um, I got there, too. I got, well, I got lost on the way to Kroger, but similar story. Which, by the way, like, isn't the mainland. So, like, just went like, fucking exactly. for, took a little dip. It's like, right, <laughs> he just did a little <laughs> little paddle in the pool and ended up there. <laughs> so, um, apparently, Jeff, I don't know how, because he's on a remote farm with three people who only speak English, But um, apparently he also taught himself, as he was learning English, taught himself French, German, Russian, Yiddish, Welsh, Flemish, Spanish, and Hebrew. Flemish. Okay, here we go. All from India, apparently. Um, So. Sure. He started holding uh, like legitimate conversations with them. As you can tell, that's a lot of information to have said. Yes. Um, But so he tell when they ask, like, what the fuck are you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which like is a fair yep. question uh jeff told them that he is quote an earthbound spirit and a ghost in the form of a mongoose has so he just like, like so first he's just a mongoose and he's like hmm let's make this more interesting i'm an 80 year old alive or dead mongoose that's been possessed by someone who is a polyglot and also i'm a gemini like that it but sounds most importantly i'm a gemini <laughs> that sounds was, like my resume <laughs> Sounds like my Instagram bio. Definitely you and all your 11 languages that you speak. Yeah. (laughs) That's, you know what? Jeff has me beat by 10 at least. By 10 only. So uh, here's the thing about Jeff where it gets a little wild because he seems to, how do I put this? Jeff seems to have a complex. Well, he's a Gemini. I mean, don't we all? (laughs) But, um, so he has very wild mood swings. Uh Uh-oh. Uh, so he has two very different moods. One is very fun and one is very not fun. Oh, no. So the Irving family said that when Jeff is in good spirits, I'm going to list all the fun things about Jeff first, the good side of of who he is. All right, I'll hold on to that part. (sighs) Because there's some real interesting things here that make me want to be homies with Jeff. Okay. So Jeff when he's in a good mood, he would guard the house and tell them when guests were arriving. Cause I guess he's like, I don't know if he's like explained yet, if he's like going through the walls or if he's like how he's, how he knows the stuff. Maybe his hearing is that good. He can like hear when someone's coming. I guess also. Yeah. And also he's, if he's maybe a spirit, then he can kind of go anywhere. Right. That's probably true. I wonder why, if you could go anywhere that you would go into the wall of a cabin, but I guess that's none of my business. (laughs) Jeff has his own agenda, okay? Clearly. <laughs> um, so they he guards the house. He tells guests, or he tells them when guests are arriving. Sometimes if people forgot to put the fire out, he would uh, put the fire out in their fireplaces at night. Um, he would wake you up if you overslept. He would scare away the mice. He would talk about their private lives with them as a, like a little advice wise man. Yeah. Um, sometimes he even left the house with them. Oh, well, they never saw him, but in spirit, he Wait, says that really? he said that his physical form was there, but you could never see it because he was always hiding behind the hedges. Oh, <laughs> but but you knew he was there because apparently he still talked the whole time. Like you could still he hear just his never voice. shuts up, huh? Gemini. Gemini. So <laughs> he would bode well with a podcast. I was going to say he probably already has one. So, uh. Yeah, so he would apparently leave the house and you knew he was there because he still wouldn't shut up. You just could never see him. Mm. Um, and so oh, he would also apparently uh, kill, there was like a massive rabbit population. So he would kill a lot of the rabbits and leave them on their doorstep for like dinner. Yum. Um, and apparently he did this so well that the Irvings ended up making a side hustle out of selling their bulk rabbits in the city. They're like, oh, don't worry, our dead mongoose caught these. <laughs> don't what? worry. Our, our mongoose phantom in the hedges. <laughs> a mongoose Who's a Gemini? Phantom. I cannot. A mongoose <laughs> phantom. We have some competition for the he title of this episode. Among Us. No? He's always Among Us. 
Goose. Among goose. Among goose. Among us. Wait a Depends minute. Depends on which of the eleven languages you're speaking. I think that's that's <laughs> the real key. I think. So uh, he also would stick up for them. Like I, I guess if the Irvings ever complained about their like one neighbor, um, he would offer to attack their livestock. Oh, that. He'd be like, wow. He'd be like, I'll fight them. Don't. Oh, okay. Um, I'll fight their also, cows. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll let them know. <laughs> Jeff is here. Um. And so he also apparently was really protective of their daughter. Uh, He was known to tell jokes. He would sing songs. His favorite songs were Carolina Moon, the National Anthem, and Home on the Range. Wow, very Americana here. I I see. Interesting. (laughs) Americana for an Indian Brit? Yeah. Wait a minute. (laughs) (laughs) Wait. Um, And the... Uh, Irving's also, I guess they got so used to him being around, they like felt obligated to feed him since he's maybe alive. Sure. And so uh, they would leave him chocolate and fruit in the ceiling beams for him to get by himself when no one was looking. And the food would disappear. So wow. they're like, okay, well, I guess he's actually eating it. Apparently his, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes that I read about Jeff. And this, by the way, if this doesn't scream Gemini. Uh-oh. <laughs> quote. Actually, I'm going to read both of my favorite quotes at the same time. Okay. Very Gemini. And also, like, perfectly, like, the balance between our two twin personalities. Oh, God. Here we go. Quote, Jeff would sleep in Voiree's room, eat bacon and sausages, ride the bus, and bring back gossip about the neighbors. When he was done with a conversation with anyone, he would just scream out, vanish, and simply disappear <laughs> back into the walls. <laughs> oh, my God. Ev, this is my this is truly like my new icon my new gemini icon he really was just like i'm here to gossip and then never mind i'm done vanish <laughs> and then leave get away from me <laughs> truly that was Back it's off. The, like i they didn't even have to tell me what his birthday was i knew the second i read that sentence that guy is a goddamn gemini i just i want to be embarrassed but really i'm just kind of proud <laughs> of our people <laughs> i feel dragged by an 80 year old mongoose who ever thought that sentence would come out of your mouth <laughs> let me read it again let me read it again okay 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 Jeff would eat bacon and sausage and ride the bus just to bring back gossip about the neighbors. When he was done with a conversation with anyone, he would simply scream out vanish and disappear back into the walls. I mean, come on. I mean, this mongoose cam all the way. I'm all over this guy. (laughs) I feel like I have a mirror held up to me. Truly. So I said all that while you still loved him. Oh, no. Oh, no. Because he also has a negative side. Oh, shit. My what Siri literally just said, I know, right? Because <gasps> I yelled, oh, no. <laughs> that scared me really badly. I think. Wait. is And now that we're in the digital age, are the walls phones? Could oh. Jeff just be here digitally? Is this a mongoose? I, anyway. I'm pretty sure. Wait a minute. Is Siri a mongoose? Um, <laughs> I, I Wow, that just scared me. And I think my, my uh, Siri is like. Yeah, finally, someone's fucking calling you out, Gemini <laughs> ass. <laughs> so uh, Jeff does have a negative side. Oh. And uh, so I wrote them out. So these are se- several quotes that he has said, but I wrote them out in the list of like kind of general rudeness all the way down to like general rudeness all the way down to like, I think Jeff needs to see someone. Oh, so um the first one, the, the nicest one, is him just being, like, kind of petty, which, like, I can still relate sure, with. Sure, sure. Uh, we're not perfect. We're not You perfect. might think so, but. You might have definitely thought so. And probably. if you thought otherwise, you were wrong. Yeah, um, right. True. So Jeff says, um, this is his rude one, quote, I have been to nicer homes than this. Carpets, piano, satin covers on polished tables. I'm going back there. Kind of just sounds like my grandma. <laughs> Where have you taken me? <laughs> right. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. What is this trash heap? Like, and then I just scream vanish. Vanish. Like, get stuck in your gross Grandma. Wall. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the next level, I, I named these these levels, but okay. I called this one annoyance. Uh-huh. Uh, and Jeff said, this was also actually, this is kind of just a Gemini thing. Um, uh. Apparently, he just liked to bother the family every now and then just to like, be like a little burst a of nuisance. chaos a nuisance and so he um 
apparently sometimes would just like heavily sigh and groan and be dramatic for 30 minutes. That's us. Just so when the family would go, why are What's you doing wrong? this, Jeff? Like, <laughs> shut up. And then he would scream back, I did it for devilment. <laughs> devilment? Like, like, like amusement, but like mischievous? Like, like devilish entertainment. Oh my God. I read I that and I went, devilment. I've also done things for devilment. I think Jeff. most of the things we do are for devilment for sure. <laughs> I, I, so all of this so far I relate to, but then we get into the part where I don't identify with, which oh, is no. the next level I've, I've deemed threat. Oh no. Which uh, he has been known to say some pretty dark things. Amongst them, he has said, if you are kind to me, I will bring you luck. And if you are not, I will kill all your poultry. I can get them wherever you put them. AKA, don't try to hide them. Don't try to hide them in the walls because that's where I live. (laughs) (laughs) Even if you hid them in the walls, that's the first place I'll look. (laughs) Oh my God, that's pretty (laughs) fucking vicious. Then we move on to the category I've deemed scary. Uh where Jeff has said, quote, I am the ghost in the form of a weasel and I shall haunt you. You don't know what damage or harm I could do if I were roused. I could kill you all, but I won't. What a little brat. Also kind of a Gemini thing to say, but I it it is a little bit. I'll kill you all if you annoy me any further. It's like, I'm going to piss you off and leave. But if you do it back, you better watch your <laughs> yeah, chicken because I, I know where I should put chickens. it. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, okay. And then this is the, like this is like the actual like really fucked up one. Where, like, oh, no. I got goose camp. So oh, like no. I know we're joking a lot for all the Geminis out there who are like going to email me saying that I'm identifying this with an actual complex. I'm not. Geminis just happen to be a little crazy sometimes. But and, this is and drinks their juice box. <laughs> But this is this is actually like the the bananagrams version. Okay. So Jeff, uh, apparently this is all several sentences separated up. So these were from different conversations, um, but I just kind of put them together just to get through this little section. So Jeff has said the following: "I'll split the atom. I'm the fifth dimension. I am the eighth wonder of the world. I am a freak." I have hands and I have feet. And if you saw me, you'd faint. You'd be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt. Oh, Jesus. So like that's where like the full blown unstableness of this. Yeah, this is a little creepy. That if I heard an 80 year old mongoose (laughs) in my walls say anything in English, (laughs) let alone those things, I would be like exterminator or I walk. I think if I saw a mong an 80 year old mongoose period, I would call an exterminator and be like, help me, please. I don't even care if it speaks English. And then all of a sudden it starts like singing like Russian hymns or something. Oh my God. Wait, what? um, I'm sorry. Just to clarify, did they ever see it? Because he just said, if you... But it said he comes out and talks to you and then disappears back into the wall, but you can't actually see him. He's always hiding. Okay, good question. So anytime that they have talked to him, it's they're literally like just talking through the wall to him. Oh, so even so, when he screams vanish, he's just like. He just, like It's literally like him just being like, goodbye. Telling like, you I'm, to go away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, this is me vanishing. I'm leaving now. And we know he's a mongoose because he said he's a mongoose. Right. Got it. It's and a mongoose hearsay. is a weasel situation. Right? Something of the sort. I think it always confused me because it sounds like a goose, but it's not a goose. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's like a ferrety, a mammal. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get there. Okay. But so he's saying a lot of nonsense like that. That was just like a sampling, a smattering, if you will. Um, but he's also, he also starts getting physical. This is where I started thinking this was like a poltergeist situation because it started with growls. And then they like yeah. kept giving it energy and now yeah. it's like talking a lot. And like and now taking it's it with them outside of the house and stuff. Following them around and it's also getting protective of things. <gasps> and now it's also starting to get a little hectic for me. This is so, insane. Okay. Okay. And now some physical manifestations where he's now throwing things at them. Oh, God. So it either we don't know if this was like him in the walls throwing things physically or if he was like telekinetically. Right. Them. Um, but some of the he does he, have hands and feet that would make you like turn into a pillar of salt. So I like that he announced that he has hands and feet because I wasn't sure. Yeah, um, me neither. To be to be fair. He uh, 
<laughs> I like how he said, I'm a freak. I have hands and feet. And also, if you saw me, you'd be petrified. <laughs> I was like, I think that that part actually, I was like, okay, this still fits our Gemini profile. Like, I'm a freak and don't <laughs> no, fucking hit me. <laughs> and I'm the eighth wonder of the world. So and watch I'm your the shit. eighth wonder of the world. There. That's that's kind of where I was like, I don't know, I still relate, but um anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he started throwing uh some some things, including jars. Rocks, stones, sand, and apparently there was one case of furniture being thrown at them. Oh, geez. This is pretty he, he was throwing it at them, but he was also throwing things at the windows from the outside of the house. Oh. So, like, at night, all of a sudden, like, rocks would be hitting their windows. That's scary. Nobody would be outside. So, there were um, also rare occasions when he started getting, or at least having so much energy that he was able to try to barge into people's rooms by breaking down their doors oh great so some there were some times where they actually had tried to barricade themselves all in one room oh my god and one time that happened and this is a quote from that soon we saw the top of the door bulging in as though some terrific force were thrusting against it but the door held then jeff's voice said i'm coming in and a few seconds later a heavy pot of ointment kept in the room crashed on its own against the bed frame oh so now he's like telepathically moving things in rooms he can't get into okay <clears throat> also remember i told you he was protective of the daughter now it sounds like he's fixated on the daughter oh, because shit. now he's obviously getting a little aggressive and voiry the daughter began getting nervous to be alone obviously and so the parents moved her bed into their room and he started screaming i'll follow her wherever you move her just like those chickens <laughs> Just like those fucking, I follow chickens too. So I, I know where he's coming from <laughs> That's at scary. the grocery store. <laughs> um, That's so uh, what's interesting about this is different articles said different things. Some said that he started out really nice, but then he started getting darker. Some said that it was always interchangeable and you never knew which version of Jeff you were going to get. And some said he actually started out really dark and then they eventually like, kind of came to a truce and he was very nice after the oh. fact. And I think that's what happened. Um, I think he was originally, I think it was probably always interchangeable, but they still kind of like loved his gossip or something. And so, yeah, like it's worth it for now. Yeah. Cause they never, in this whole story, they never asked for help from anyone to get rid of this thing. And they never even thought about moving. I think it was just like, they kind of lived with like a shitty roommate. Wow. I think that's how we've all been there. And probably we were that (laughs) shitty roommate since we're kind of, we definitely were trying to, break down their doors for sure. <laughs> and throw ointment everywhere so uh I'll, even when he was in a good mood he was like jeff himself seemed unsure of his own abilities so that's where like the real um uh skepticism really kicks in the real skepticism kicks in this is the <laughs> fucking talking bongos but like if it were real to others and like if we were really believing this as fact even jeff's story never really stayed straight so uh, sometimes he seemed more like a ghost or a poltergeist. Sometimes he seemed more like a cryptid. Sometimes he was neither. And he was like just this weird mystical creature. And he himself would just call himself an extra, extra clever mongoose. Wow. Like, of course. He so was. extra clever that I now have vocal cords and can speak English. And Flemish too. <laughs> and also make things move when I'm not there. What the fuck? So uh, Margaret, the wife, at one point even like shouted at Jeff and was like, Hey, you know, my husband's not home yet. Where is he? And Jeff said, I don't know. I have not got my magic phones on. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Uh, but then, it, so like in times like that, it sounds like he's like this mystical yeah. sprite of sorts. Right. But then there's other times where they would ask him questions specifically about death because he was a ghost. He said, And they would ask him questions about death and he would have answers for that. So like they said, oh, what is death? And he said, oh, it's simply a changeover. So like he seemed a changeover into a talking mongoose. Into a mongoose. Uh, But so he I guess the story gets starts getting more twisted and that like we don't really know. Is he a ghost or is he a cryptid or is he like some sort of um, there was one story that suggested he was somehow part of witchcraft. Oh. Like he was actually a legitimate mongoose that was like possessed or something. Oh. Um, kind of like uh Binks from Right, Focus like Hex. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so 
Eventually, they also began to see Jeff. This is to answer your question earlier. They started to see him in glimpses, very quick glimpses. And he was described uh, pretty universally. Like, the story changed every now and then. But for the most part, it was understood that um, James described him as a nine-inch long yellow ferret weasel breed um, with a long bushy tail with black speckles. He was that small? I pictured a much bigger animal. I did too. I thought he was going to be like like snake sized. <laughs> yeah, like a big bo- big boy. A big boy. Um, <laughs> and so they got glimpses every now and then. But Voiri said that she could see him in full moments, not just glimpses. Oh. So they would actually look at each other. Wow. Um, and she added the fact that he actually has a snout like a hedgehog. So oh, that's specific. Um, so the local papers had heard about this. You know, just from, I guess, them talking in town about this fucking mongoose. Yep. And so the local papers ran articles about the Dalby spook and left. uh, This led uh, Jeff's story spreading to the mainland. And at that point, it kind of became this like wild sensation of like a potentially talking possessed mongoose in someone's house. And so several news outlets picked it up and that led to a bunch of remember, this is right around spiritualism's resurgence. And so a lot of paranormal investigators and spiritualists and skeptics all wanted to come to the house to investigate Jeff. One of them being Harry price. So, um, some reporters actually swear that they also saw glimpses of Jeff and that they got pictures, but it really just looked like a really blurry squirrel. Like they didn't (laughs) actually think it was him. Um, and some also swear that they heard Jeff's voice. One of them even said that Jeff, um, gave this guy, betting tips for one of the races coming up oh wow that's so apparently nice. he's, he's also a gambler i guess um, so so one thing that people actually did well i guess this is like one of the running theories but they figured that there might be mongooses in the area because back in 1912 a farmer supposedly introduced mongooses to the area to get rid of the rabbit population oh interesting so that could be he could be like the last mongoose around since 1912 right um but so Harry Pr- Harry Price, um, he knew about this. And also, I guess James had been writing him really constantly saying, you need to check out my house. My mongoose. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I guess Harry Price was doing, he was clearly busy. If you listen to my last episode, yeah. <laughs> he had a lot of stuff going on. So he sent out one of his colleagues, because also remember, he created this like huge lab for himself yes. with all these people who volunteered to help him. So he sent out one of his colleagues named James Dennis, who in a lot of stories was James McDonald, but apparently that was like a fake name. Oh. Um, so James Dennis went on behalf of him and was convinced that Jeff was real. Wow. So he went to visit three different times. And in 1935, this is a quote from Dennis and his experience there. He said, quote, the voice started in earnest and the noise in the house was amazing. There were shrill screams accompanied by terrific knocking, loud bangs, uh, which emanated all from all parts of the house in quick succession as if the perpetrator moved with lightning speed. Wow. So we heard the voice in like all parts of the house and like Damn. that a person wouldn't be able to replicate. Wow. Um, he also saw objects fly down from the top of the stairs while hearing disembodied laughter. Ew. So eventually, I guess he said enough things to Harry Price where he was like, okay, I'll go over myself. And also this James guy keeps writing me. So he went over, but he brought another colleague named Rex, who was actually, he was a big editor at the BBC originally. Um, His name was Richard Lambert, but everyone called him Rex. Um, And so I guess Rex went on a few different cases or followed Harry on a bunch of cases. Um, but this happened to be one of them. And when they got there, Jeff mysteriously never showed himself. Oh, so there was no sign of Jeff being there. So all Harry could do, um, was take samples of things. Cause apparently Jeff had left some prints or some like of his fur. Do, do mongooses have fur or hair? Fur. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) I'm going to say fur. Fur. Um, but so they, he had left like little footprints on the walls or like, or, um, hair samples and tooth marks because apparently he would bite onto the bacon fat because he liked bacon so much and so they had tooth marks and stuff like that so he took um clay impressions of all these prints right he sent them to experts because a lot of people obviously at this point in harry's life were 
helping him from all realms. Right. So he had like zoologists helping him and things like that. Damn. So he sent stuff to the Natural History Museum and naturalists came back saying that the dog was actually or the the hair was actually dog fur. Oh um, shit. And they did at one point have a sheep dog named Mona that they like never talk about, but apparently it could have been sheep dog hair. Oh no. And the prints and the tooth marks uh, came back from the Natural History Museum. Uh, the people there said that the prints could not match any known animal. So in theory, it could. It's not any other animal that they're replicating it with. Wow. But it's not a mongoose. Um, so Damn. they said that the, the prints conceivably could have been from a dog. So it could also be Mona. Um, but so... They said that no matter what, the prints were definitely not mongoose. It could have been dog. It could have been something wild out there, but it was not mongoose. I don't know why. what I was expecting, but I'm sad now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, also the prints, uh, like the footprints, apparently had, uh, they did not have the same texture or skin texture as a mongoose. It looked like they were manually carved out with a stick. Oh, bummer. So that's. Not that this is the moment when people started assuming this was a hoax. I'm pretty sure since sure. day one, people thought it was a hoax. But um, they thought that, <clears throat> I guess Harry Price was the first person to say maybe it was Voiry who was up to this. And the family mm-hmm. was going along with it. Um, and they thought maybe she was doing it out of pure boredom of being so isolated. Yeah, it sounds like you would be. But that was my question, too, because I was like, if that were the case, who started it? And it's so weird if you drag your daughter into it. But I guess if she started it, it's less alarming. Like, it's more like a child pulling off some prank. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder if they were being really supportive of an imaginary friend and the news got out and they and it had got to, out like, of hand roll with it. Yeah. But even then, it's like at some point as the parent, like, you kind of like... Not like you'd have your so. have your child scared to sleep in her room by herself because of like, an imaginary friend. Right. You know? And like threatening to like murder other people's livestock and stuff. That's like extreme for for a child's uh, imaginary friend, I think. Right. But so uh, Voiri, yes, yeah, so they assume that she's probably just lonely. Um, and Rex, his assistant, even quoted saying, Voiri's very lonely um, and has only her parents for company, and they're much older. There's no young people around. We wanted to talk to Voiri ourselves, but she is close and very reserved. So I guess him and Harry Price had this thought of like, let's get her away from the house so we can hopefully talk to her away from her parents. Right. Because right. at this point, they were like, De- like, is she the one that's causing this and her family's playing along or is her family doing something and she's forced to play along? That would suck. That would be worse, I think. I don't know so, which one's worse. But. <laughs> well, so they suggested to take her on like a boat tour um, by herself, but then James invited himself along and monopolized the conversation so she never got to talk. And um, basically, while Harry Price was there, he found that he knew that Jeff started in the walls. And so he was looking through the walls and he found that there was a lot of space between the foundation <gasps> and the wood. Oh. And so he thinks that this is a quote from him that the space, quote, made the whole house one great speaking tube with walls like sounding boards. And by speaking into one of the many apertures in the panels, it should be possible to convey the voice to various parts of the house. So basically, it was this massive echoing space um wow and so he if that's true he knew it was someone in there and it was probably the smallest one she could climb in there there. yeah yeah um still after all that um he i guess his reports from jeff this is uh, just a fun fact but his reports from the investigation and james's personal diaries are part of that archive i told you about of his of like Mm -hmm. thirteen thousand. oh yeah um Still, they ended up walking away with no evidence. Um, and so, like, I mean, they had evidence that it wasn't right, a mongoose, right, but they right. also <laughs> never had any definitive Supporting, evidence. okay. Yeah. So, because he is so on the fence about everything, he never validated any claims, but he also never accused anyone of a hoax. But him and Rex did write a book called The Haunting of Cashin's Gap in 1936. And he claimed that he was... Um, this was during his time, if you remember in the last episode, where he was 
like a huge self publicist and was like doing all these wild things for the press to pay attention to him. Oh yeah. Like the new setting the New York times on fire. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So he apparently did, uh, this was one of those little cases where he was like, I know people are going to think this is a hoax no matter what, but at least it's interesting enough that people will get involved in paranormal research. So, um, he didn't have a problem walking out of there caring whether or not it was a hoax, but Rex actually almost got fired, um, from the BBC because, since he was still skeptical after everything, because he never had any definitive proof, the higher ups thought he was unstable, and oh, so he no. s- he sued them for libel or for slander. Is are they the same thing? No, um, okay. slander is spoken and libel is written. Okay, so for slander, and the case ended up being co- uh, being known as the mongoose case. So. Oh well, th- that and is pretty spot on, I guess. <laughs> and he he won and kept his job, but. Just a fun fact. Wow. But so um, real quick, the other investigators that went out there, there were several, but just a few of their findings was there was one guy named um, Christopher Joseph, who actually, I think he wasn't part of the original investigation, but was looking through documents and things like that. And he he actually used like articles and reports and sketches and things from Harry Price. Harry Price's library of magical literature. And he actually uh, met a man too, who said that he remembered the Irvings always having, a, this is a quote, always having a mongoose to catch and eat the cockroaches. And at times when the mongoose was out, Voiry would throw her voice as if the mongoose was talking as a fun game. Oh shit. Well, that explains it pretty thoroughly. So He's the only one who happened to find that information. But if it's true, then there's your answer. Explains it. I just wonder about Voiry. Like, does she really speak Flemish or did did they? she, did she just make noises and was like, that's Flemish? I feel like that's probably the case. <laughs> okay. Like, there's no way, right? Like, Right. Yeah, like, that's pretty extreme. Then she has, like, some other supernatural abilities herself, I think. Yeah, then she's actually – she's probably possessed by yeah. a <laughs> polyglot. So um, Joseph was actually – What's interesting about uh, Joseph is he found out that there was like a mongoose there and she was throwing her voice a lot. But even though he was confident originally, he'd figure out if it was a hoax or something supernatural. He ended up saying that the evidence was still really conflicting. Oh. Um, And then Nandor Fodor, Nandor Fodor, I always forget how to pronounce it, but he's also like a big guy in paranormal research. Right. I'll probably do a story on him one day, but... He was one of the people to also investigate Jeff, and he initially believed the family to a point where he was quoted saying, all the evidence is in favor of Jeff being an actual talking animal. What? Really? Okay. But he changed his mind later (laughs) to, obviously, he changed his mind later to what I think is probably the most, this is my personal belief, um, is, is his theory, where he says that the family... The family genuinely believed it and weren't trying to be deceitful. Like the wife and the child really believed it. But James had some oh. sort of split off psyche. So not oh. that I actually, I wouldn't like, you know, I'm no doctor. But right, right. the theory is that the family as a unit had developed some mental health problems. Due to their, de, a shared delusion. <laughs> Bingo. Due to their also a Fall Out Boy album. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is due to their extreme isolation. Um, they wow. say that James was mentally starving, which oh. rem- feels a little too close to home given the quarantine. Yeah, but um, a- this is a quote. There was no way to relieve his mental starving by conscious means, so his unconscious took care of the job, and uh, it produced the strange hybrid of Jeff, fitting no category of humans, animals, or ghosts, yet having common features with all of them. Wow. So it was like his brain was so desperate to entertain like disassociative. itself. Disassociative. It created this thing. And wow. His, and his, fer- his family kind of either went along with it or even almost believed it themselves, um, oh which my. is interesting because for a magical creature, he really doesn't fit any of the like taxonomy yeah. for like a ghost or a cryptid or anything like that. And so that usually would imply that it's something more psychological because it doesn't fit any of the categories we already know. Right, right, right. Um, and this is especially because James later was also known to not keep a consistent story or description of Jeff. One of the earlier quotes was, I never said he was a mongoose. I don't think he is an animal. I think he's in he's a spirit in animal form. And then there's other times where he literally said the quote, undoubtedly he's a species of mongoose, mm-hmm. but whether a hybrid or not, I can't say. So 
even that was kind of messy. Um, and then this is where it gets a little dark, but this is one of the other theories is that they're so just like how Jeff was super protective of Voiri, um, they, they might think it was, uh, some sort of psychological issue with Voiri who was protecting herself through this persona of Jeff because there were rumors of sexual assault. I was very afraid you were going to say that. So it would explain why Jeff was so protective of her. Um, And that being said, that's like just one little quip of a theory. It's not like confirmed to be like a massive theory, but it was mentioned. Sure. Um, Also, some think that she was honestly just so fucking bored. And so she did this. She pulled this whole thing off just to scare her parents into moving to the mainland. Oh, wow. Wow. A, n- a much nicer version of the theory. I'd, I'd prefer to go with that one, yeah. <laughs> and uh, actually, one of the reporters said that they actually caught her making noise, and then James tried to redirect his face or his like head to somewhere else, being like, "Oh no, you didn't hear her throw her voice." Oh wow! So it sounds like the f- another theory is the whole family was in it for the sake of fame, right. because their you know his business had crumbled, and you know they were struggling. Um. The sweeping theory, and this was something that Harry Price also agreed on, uh, or at least confirmed was one of his own theories, is that Voiri was a um, undercover ventriloquist. She like had some really good skills that nobody knew about. Oh, and so she basically, even if she was in the room with you, could throw her voice all around, and if she was close enough to a wall, it would echo. Whoa! And either her parents believed it or perpetuated it for the sake of fame. And there was one really good quote from someone who said, this extra, extra mongoose was an imaginary companion created by the Irving's extra, extra clever daughter. And so, um, so anyway, James ended up dying in 1945. So Margaret and Foy resold the farm to a motorcycle racer named Leslie Graham. Sure. And he, like two years into living there, actually trapped and killed an animal that matched Jeff's descriptions. And he killed so- Jeff. The press made it look like he definitely killed Jeff, but he posted pictures of it and Voiri saw the pictures and maintained that that was not Jeff. Um, And then ever since then, the farmhouse has been destroyed and Voiri died in 2005. But even then she maintained that Jeff was real and her family was just victims of this weird mystical creature. Oh no. Oh my gosh. Anyway, that's the story of Jeff. What the F? (laughs) <laughs> that is the one I, kn- I knew nothing about this case nothing i me either i've seen people like ask about it before and i was like i'm gonna have to keep that one in my back pocket so cool well that was the wildest story ever um i had no it, idea it was a reflection piece really a considering reflection piece <laughs> considering gemini season's coming along this is like quite an introduction to gemini season i think i mean we'll be in it already when this comes out because um this the 25th like- or the 26th is the cusp or no, is the, the beginning first? Maybe is it first? I thought. Oh, so. maybe. I thought it was like always the twenty first. Oh, 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 oh! It is one of my friend's birthdays is on the twenty fifth, and so I always assume that because she's on the cusp, she might have not made it. Oh yeah, no, it's the twenty first or May twenty okay. first to, to it, June twenty first. So we are we are we are in it, folks. By the time this <sighs> is we are in Jeff's season. I just, I love, I just love this. I love that story and it's just so crazy and I knew nothing about it. And I've heard about it, but I knew nothing about it. But I like the season of Jeff. I appreciate the season of Jeff. A Jeff Manai. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Moving on. Your turn. Um, okay. I have a story for you that has been requested by a lot of people and is also um, something that I had first heard of back in Boston when we did our show, or maybe it was even before that, um, one of our good friends, Ryan, who was in our wedding, he was like, he was like, he asked me, he always asked me like a million questions about the podcast and everything. And, um, his wife's like Marianne's super scared of ghosts. But every time I see her, she's like, can you tell me more about ghosts? But then she gets like legitimately really afraid and is like, Aww. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. And I'm like, okay. Um, and so they, he had told me about, Oh, I'm unfrozen. Yay. So he had told me about this story and I'd always meant to look into it. And then recently um, somebody like suggested it in the close friends group or whatever. And I, uh, I decided to finally do it. So this is the story of the smiley face killers. Mm, okay. I've heard you talk about it, but I don't know anything about it. 
So I got a little confused because there is a smiley face killer from like the 19, I don't know, the early 20th century. Hmm. And this is, this is like different. copycat? No, this is like a completely different Kate story. Um, hmm. I feel like once you get the actual, once there's like a deemed killer with that name, I feel like it's really hard to earn that name. Again. Yeah, I, it's kind of vague and obscure. So I don't really know. This is definitely like the main story the gotcha. smiley face killers um but that one i think i got it confused with that one mm. and that's why i anyway it doesn't matter but so this is the story of the smiley face killers um and i'm gonna tell you up front what the theory is and then i'm gonna go through the timeline and explain why this theory kind of exists so it's pretty creepy um so the smiley face murder theory uh, sometimes called the smiley face murders, the smiley face killings, the smiley face gang. Uh, I know a lot of names um, is a theory advanced by retired New York city detectives, Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, as well as a criminal justice professor named Dr. Lee Gilbertson, who's also a gang expert at St. Cloud Ooh. state university, which alleges that a number of young men found dead in bodies of water across several Midwestern American states from the late 90s to the 2010s did not accidentally drown, as concluded by law enforcement agencies, but were victims of a serial killer who left behind the calling card of a graffitied smiley face at the dump site of each body. Oh. That was like the longest sentence in the history of uh, the Isle of Man, but... <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> but does that make sense? I like, no, that makes that sense. Out. Okay. No, that was great. Good job. Good job oh, writing thank that. Thank you. I, I parsed it all from Wikipedia and turned it into one giant sentence. Um, <laughs> but I also want to preface this whole story by saying most law enforcement and investigators are either range from skeptical of the whole theory, if not outright dismissive of it and being like, this is just baloney. <sighs> Oh, okay. So you'll see why people disagree about this. Um, and I actually listened to two different podcasts, uh, Martinis and Murder and Thinking Sideways, and they both had extremely different outlooks on it, which was really oh. interesting. Like in Thinking Sideways, they went into it saying like, this is all bunk science and like it's phony. And then in um, the Martinis and Murder episode, they were like, wow, this is like we they interviewed these actual guys and like believed it. So it's I don't know. You can make your own conclusion, I suppose. Um, So the timeline starts in 1997 in New York City uh, when 21-year-old Fordham University student Patrick McNeil disappeared after a night out at the Dapper Dog Bar. Dapper Dog. That sounds like a great bar. It does sound cute. Um, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds cute. (laughs) Um, His body was not found until 47 days later. And it was found floating in the East River. And at first, the death was determined to be an accidental drowning. But the uh, an NYPD missing persons detective named Kevin Gannon promised uh, the McNeil family, Patrick's family, that he would find out what happened because neither he nor the family believed that this was an accidental death. They think it was a homicide. Mm. And interestingly enough, this actually would later prove correct, and it was uh, determined that he was murdered, and the case is still unsolved and Ooh. open. So this is like still, and this is from '97. Um, in the autopsy report, so I'm just gonna like say a couple things that they found in the autopsy report that kind of started this whole theory as to like the spate of murders, and some of it's kind of disturbing, but oh well. Um, that's our okay. show. <laughs> So in the autopsy report, the medical examiner first referenced a ligature mark around Patrick's neck, which led them to believe that he had been bound in some way and potentially tortured is what they believed. Mm. Um, They also found, this is where it gets kind of gross, fly eggs in his pubic hair. (gasps) Yep. (laughs) I told you. (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. That's awful. Gnarly. Gnarly. Um, So... We're not moving on. I'm going to keep talking about it. Oh. Um, <laughs> so they found please fly eggs. In, and I have to explain why that's indicative of kind of something off about an accidental drowning. So there were multiple fly eggs in the pubic hairs of Patrick's groin area, and they were in an arrested state of development. And Gannon and his team concluded that Patrick had to have been dead on land for a period of time in order for the flies to lay their eggs before he was put mm. into the water because flies do not lay eggs in temperatures under 52, especially in water. So then they were like, well, this must be 
this is this is also according to their website this list so i will preface with that information but it does make um it does make it a homicide in their eyes and it uh brings into the question like first the late remark then the um why was like his groin area out of water for that long that uh, mm-hmm. flies could have laid eggs there if he wasn't found for 47 days like what was happening in between that time right and according to the medical examiner's report, they, there was also severe blackening of his head and upper torso, which they believed was um, advanced uh, exposure to the elements outside of water, perhaps burning even. But a lot of investigators adamantly disagree about that and say it's just natural from body decomp. decomp. Yeah, okay. exactly. So given all this, uh, proponents of the smiley face theory believe Patrick's death was not an accidental drowning. They believe he was stalked, abducted, held for an extended period of time and tortured, murdered, and then disposed in the water. And after his torture and burning, they believe he remained on land for a short period of time in order for the houseflies to lay eggs in his groin area. That's the last time I'll say that phrase, I promise. (laughs) Um, During this time, decomp had started and became visible on his legs. They believe that he was then transported to Owl's Head, where he was placed into the East River and was later discovered. Oh, there's something else really gross that I'm about to say. I had a hunch when you said, I'm done talking about the groin flies. (laughs) I was like, something worse is coming. Here it is. It's grosser to me. Um, So there was an absence, an absent. What am I saying? An An absence? No, and at, like uh, it was absent. So oh, an absence. An absence. I don't know why I, suddenly that word means nothing to me. Um, there was an absence of skin slippage on his feet, which is a thing that happens uh, like in water. Your skin will like slide. <laughs> it's so gross. It will what? Mine doesn't do that. No, slide? when you're dead. Oh. <laughs> I, like, I sure hope not. I was like, am I the weird one here? Okay, no, got it, like got it. there's like skin slippage. If your body's found in the water, like your skin will be kind of oh, detached, I believe, from your body. And so there was a lack of that apparently on his so feet and legs. So it could been in the water for very long. That's what they, yes, that's what they that's propose. Right. Exactly. So skin slippage, I'm I'm pretty sure is the last super gross word I'm going to say. Um, <sighs> yeah, this one's just, I don't know. Uh, yuck. So that was in 97. Then between 97 and 98, three more young men went missing in Manhattan, and they were eventually recovered all in the East and Hudson Rivers, and they were all dead. Um, And Gannon and his partner, Anthony Duarte, at this point, believe they're seeing a pattern in these deaths. And in 2001, Gannon retired from the NYPD, and he and Duarte began to investigate this in a more, like, head-on serious fashion and try to, like, figure out an actual theory on this. So in 2003, they identified at least a dozen cases of accidental drownings that they believed were all connected. And they kind of determined this because near the uh, dumping of each body, they were able to find a smiley faced graffiti nearby the body. And so it's at that point that they're thinking um, this person, this killer is leaving a calling card for us and or killers, plural. Um, and it's it's a smiley face graffiti, and that's kind of how they began this uh, smiley face theory. So in 2006, Gannon and Duarte were joined by that guy I said was a gang expert, uh, Dr. Lee Gilbertson. And he, based on his own personal investigation, also believed the smiley face theory. So his interest came from the disappearance of 21-year-old Minnesota University student Chris Jenkins. And he... Uh, was last seen, it was like Halloween 2002, and he was at a bar uh, and he was wearing like, which is definitely not appropriate, like an American Indian costume. Um, and that it's part of the story, but I you know. know, not appropriate. But he was wearing that costume at a Halloween party at a bar. He got really wasted. He was kicked out of the bar and his friends apparently didn't even notice he was gone. And unfortunately, he was kicked out. He was in his costume, but he had left his coat and his phone and his wallet inside. So he had not um, he didn't have an and it was like 20 degrees out. And it, so gotcha. he had nothing with him. Um, so that it was, it was just <laughs> a bad start to the night. Yeah. Um, and he vanished that night and uh, he was recovered. His body was recovered in the Mississippi River four months later. I believe it was like f- 12 miles I forget how many miles, but I believe it was like 12 miles away. Um, 
and his body was found in the Mississippi River, and his cause of death was originally uh, concluded to be an accidental drowning. Um, and he was actually found still in his costume. And do, so an inmate at a jail, I guess an inmate informant, told okay. police that this was actually a homicide and he had information about it. And so his death was actually reclassified as a homicide in 2006. So this is like the second confirmed homicide in their kind of thread of deaths. Got it. Um, okay. The other ones are still ruled accidental drownings. This is a second like actual murder. Um, and his this is still an open case as well. So we don't really have much information on it. But as far as I heard on um, Thinking Sideways, they were saying it. they believe it may have been a gang initiation that he was killed. Oh, um, okay. And perhaps just abducted off the street and murdered and dumped in the water as part of a gang initiation, something on that along those lines. Um, but it is classified as a homicide and is still an open case. And so in, and that was in 06. So in 2008, Gannon, Duarte, and Gilbertson held a press conference, and this is where they kind of announced the smiley face killer theory to the world. And there was an investigative reporter named Christy Peel, and she helped break and popularize this story. Um, she, The story, as she publicized it, goes as follows. 40 accidental drowning deaths of college-aged men were, in fact, murdered by a serial killer. Mm. Excuse me. The murders began in the mid to late 90s and span 11 states. La Crosse, Wisconsin is home to at least eight of the smiley face killer or killer's victims. But Massachusetts, New York, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania also have more than a few potential victims. Wow. The victims all fit a similar profile. So this is a big part of like that the thread of this whole theory um, is that the, the victims are all really similar. They're all Caucasian young men who were described as popular, smart, and sporty. And they had everything going for them. A lot of them were extremely athletic, were like very, you know, strapping young men, essentially. And were all young white males. And um, they were also all seen last leaving a bar or a party alone after drinking and are were possibly drugged without their knowledge. Got it. Okay. And they also believed the victims may have been tortured and held for some time. Yeah. And when asked, like, well, why would somebody be doing this? What's the motive of a serial killer who's killing all these men? And the trio said they believe the motive was envy and that the perpetrator was the opposite of the victims, meaning he was clumsy, ugly, and dumb. And that's a direct quote. <laughs> okay. Well, so that's from the experts' word, the expert's <laughs> mouth. So, yeah. So they thought maybe, basically, they were insinuating that this person was so clumsy ugly and dumb that they were jealous of these like perfectly strapping popular young men and killed them out of envy so that's their kind of motive that they presented and this got to the point that the fbi actually released a statement on the smiley face killers which they called the fbi called the midwest river deaths on the Mm. same day as the press conference and this is uh kind of long but this is what the fbi had to say okay excuse me Over the past several years, law enforcement and the FBI have received information about young college-aged men who were found deceased in rivers in the Midwest. The FBI has reviewed the information about the victims provided by two retired police detectives who have dubbed these incidents the smiley face murders and interviewed an individual who provided information to the detectives. To date, we have not developed any evidence to support links between these tragic deaths or any evidence substantiating the theory that these deaths are the work of a serial killer or killers. The vast majority of these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings. The FBI will continue to work with local police in the affected areas to provide support as requested. Essentially, the FBI is saying, no, these are just drunk kids drowning. They were just saying bullshit. Yes. And they're saying, exactly. And they're saying, this is not a serial killer as far as we believe. And like, it's just drunk guys drowning by accident. I mean, it is, it seems... I would believe it. So far, I believe it. The the theory, which one? The theory that it's not bullshit, that there's like a string of 40 people, all with similar looks and reputations across 11 states or whatever, all being killed in pretty much the same way with a calling card. It yeah. sounds legitimate. It sounds, it sounds like really sketchy that this would all be happening. I will say there are definitely a lot of red flags to me about the theory I mean, I'll get into those, but like, for example, 
a lot of them happen like the same day or the same week. And and oh. you think like, not a lot, I believe only one of them happened like on the same day. Um, and you think like, well, then that would mean there's like a whole operation of these people. Right. And then it has ha- to be multiple people yeah. in on this. And they said that's possible as part of their theory, but also, you know, that would be multiple decades of this going on without anybody slipping or saying a word. Yeah. The only um, way I can, I guess the only way that I, I still think it's possible, but the only way I think it's possible is if it is like a gang initiation or like people of diff- like a reason for multiple people. Like an organizational type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the obviously the smiley face makes it just that much creepier that um, they happen to be finding these smiley faces nearby where the bodies are dumped at the same time. So some of them are really creepy. Like there was this man found in... Uh, dead and un- like underneath the bar where he was found on the wood there was like a smiley face graffiti Ew. like that got me but then so going into this before we go further do you have you already made your decision like of what you think happened or are you yeah okay. i'm i'm a little on the f- i could see both ways but i'm 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 persuaded in one particular direction. Okay, got it. And I'll say my like ultimate thoughts on it at the end. But yeah, I do find it. I mean, it is fascinating and creepy. I will say like some of the smiley faces that were found were farther away from the bodies. Like they had to be kind of discovered. It was a leap. Yeah, a leap. A- exactly. That's like the perfect word. Some of it seems a little bit like a stretch. Um and like, you know, it's creepy that there were smiley face graffitis, but I would imagine, I don't know much about graffiti. I imagine a smiley face is probably a pretty common one if you're testing out a spray can right. spray can or spray paint can. I don't know that, but you know, I don't think it's like the most specific. I it's fair it's a fair argument that like pretty much anywhere you go, I'm sure there's a smiley face. So that like, was for, my thought. Yeah. So if there's a death I okay, well now I understand. You know, and so, like confirmation bias, like you're like, oh, a smiley face, but it's like there's probably right. a lot of those out there that you don't notice on a regular basis. Like if someone died on in on my apartment floor right now, like maybe right next to the 10 smiley faces I drew on a piece of paper today, exactly. you know? <laughs> yeah. And that would definitely not be a murder. That would be an accidental drowning for sure in your house. <laughs> so a question then. Have you, uh, by the end of this, will you tell us your your verdict on Jeff? Because you, on also, Jeff? you also didn't give an answer on that one. And they oh. are... Both potentially just urban legends. That's a good point. They actually, that's a good point because this is considered by some people an urban legend. By some, they consider it like a real crime theory. Some people think it's an urban legend. So, yes, we'll give, I will. We'll give our full reports of both stories at the good end. Good idea. Yes. Good idea. Okay. So, at this point, um, Gannon, Duarte, Gilbertson, and now Peel, this Christy Peel, who's the investigative reporter, they continue to investigate accidental drowning deaths and they start enlisting the families of the victims. So Gannon and Duarte make media appearances, including interviews on Fox News um, with Geraldo Rivera. And they now believe a gang of killers are responsible and are working in cooperation with each other because there are so many deaths that span so much space that right. would have to be multiple people. So the quartet believes the smiley face is just one of the symbols that the gang of killers use. Others include the word Cincinnati, which is an indigenous word meaning rattlesnake. And they found that word uh, near a body. And then um, I believe one of the next bodies that was found was found uh, in the Cincinnati River or in, oh, in a, I see. a port or something with that name. Um, and that's just something I heard on, uh, uh, which one was it? Oh, Martinis and Murder. Now I'm getting them mixed up. Um, so that's that's at least what I heard on their show. Um, is that that bo- the next body was found with in in a similar place with that name. Gotcha. Um, so in late 2010, the nonprofit Center for Homicide Research Studies. Uh, oh nope, that's wrong. They studied <laughs> 40 of Gannon and Duarte's proposed victim cases. So they took 40 of these to assess them and see if they could find a pattern. And the CHRs are called released a report that was critical of this theory of the smiley face killer theory. And they called it drowning the smiley face murder theory, which I guess someone was trying to be clever and perhaps maybe was a little insensitive, I think. But because they they drowned either whether it was a murder or not. But okay, right. Plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Drowning the smiley face murder theory. And 
This report uh, lays out 18 points of contention with supporting evidence against the smiley face theory. So okay. I'm going to read some of these points. So, for example, the graffiti, the time of the graffiti, some of it was found months later, months after the bodies were found, which would negate a connection between finding the body and finding the smiley face. Like someone would go four months later and say, oh, well, here's a smiley face. But the body had been already taken four months before. So it's right. hard so to say. There's- there's no way to really timeline them out appropriately that yes. like, they both existed at the same time. Exactly. So it could just gotcha. be a coincidence or maybe it wasn't even there. Um, then again, I don't know, maybe they can argue someone came back to the site of the body dumping right. and put it there. So that's, I guess, fair. Um, and again, graffiti is omnipresent. It's everywhere. Smiley face graffiti has apparently existed for at least 4,000 years. Um, that's how old drawing smiley faces. Is I that guess. how old a fucking smiley face is? I guess so, right? Like, Why did I think it just came out in like maybe the 50s? Yeah, I, like, I don't know. It's really hard for me to process that anything happened before the 50s. And I don't know why. Yes, we know that. Em. <laughs> I know. But like when I think... To me, well, like if you the, think about cave drawings, like an eye, an eye, and a mouth, you know? That's true. I guess could be a thing. I don't know. I mean, I guess you're right. You're the one that researches this. I just, <laughs> it blows my mind that like, also, we all know that 4,000 years doesn't seem like it could have existed. So <laughs> anyway. a flat earther. It doesn't matter. No. I, I'm I not a flat can't. earther. That's not a good uh, gossip to spread. I'm definitely someone who, uh, I'm not a flat earther, but I definitely find it hard to believe that. 50 years ago, anyone was here. It yeah. blows my mind. Nobody existed before we were born is what I'm No, thinking. but like my grandparents were the earliest people on earth. I see. Because sure. you can see them with your own two eyes. That's the truth. I don't know what's wrong with my brain. I just can't visualize anything outside of that. <laughs> oh, my. Um. So anyway, apparently smiley faces have existed for at least 4,000 years and are so popular because they're so simple. And like I said, you know, if you're, you have a spray can... And like, what else are you going to do? Yeah. Draw a smiley face. Like it doesn't well, even seem- like just to test it, like a sample. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I will also say um, uh, the smiley faces were different. So some of them had round eyes. Some of them didn't. And so they like look different. And that's when they say, well, you know, this could be a gang of killers. But to me, it also kind of points out like these are still very different symbols. You know, that's definitely an argument towards it. Not. Yeah. Because I, I mean. I mean, if you're just going off of any goddamn smiley face that you see, then exactly. like you might as well go off of anything that's blue or like exactly. Like, who's to say? Yeah, okay. it feels like you're like looking for connections or a pattern. Right. Um, so none of those smiley faces remotely matched each other. Um, and then the word Cincinnati was considered a red herring. It's a relatively common term in the Midwest. It's in the names of schools, towns, businesses, roads, bridges, and a river. And so it's not that odd that it would have found its way into graffiti. Um, right. And like I said, that one body was found in the Cincinnati River, which was a strange connection. But at the same time, like the fact that the word was found in a totally different place um, in the Midwest, where this is a relatively common term, it's well, not like that in, strange. In Virginia, like I see tags all the time of RVA, which is Richmond. Right. And so right. like if someone died in Richmond next to a wall that's covered in RVA, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. it wouldn't be that wild. It, yes, like, every exactly. Wall that, so exactly. So that's another one where it's like, I guess they, and now it seems like, you know, you're just adding more symbols. Like there wasn't a smiley face, but there was the word since So it's a right. little bit like, well, which one is it? Um, and then proximity. So there was no established distance between where the bodies were found or entered into the water and the location of the smiley faces. So like I said, some were like really far away and they just kind of happened to explore around and find it like down the river. Um, so it's not like wherever they were found, it was next to the body. Um, a lot of times they were pretty distant. And then evidence of victim trauma. So the vast majority of victims had little or no bodily trauma. And they said, you know, all of these people were murdered and potentially tortured. And this basically the evidence of the bodies, most of them don't show any evidence except for those two homicides. Um, Don't really show any evidence that these bodies were tortured or held for a long time or anything of that nature. And then there's homicidal drownings, which are extremely rare. So apparently drowning someone um, to murder them is only accounts for 0.2% of all U.S. homicides. Really? yeah, but I think that's because, like, it's so much easier to, like, shoot someone or right. strangle or stab them than it is to, like, hold them underwater 
right. in a body of water where you're not going to be seen. You know what I mean? And that's and that's specifically homicidal drownings, not accidental. homicidal, ex- not accidental, okay. exactly. Which is yeah, why it's got to be really hard to hold a, a whole human being down. I think water. so, especially one of these like quote unquote strapping young men. You know, like these right. athletic guys. Um, right. So that's another point is that they were saying you know it's much more statistically like likely that they drowned accidentally. Um, in 21 years studied, only 117 homicidal drownings occurred among people in the college age range, 18 to 24. Um, and the idea that water washes away evidence is actually a myth. So when correctly, oh. which I didn't know at all, I really thought that water would get rid of a lot of. I guess that makes sense. If you like wash your hands from having like blood all over them, like you could still see it That's under true. the UV light after you wash your hands. That's true. Yeah, exactly. And like from what I heard too, is that you can still test the body alcohol content of a body, even if it's been in the water, because as long as the blood is still there, it'll still tell you the amount of alcohol. And um, a lot of that's how they were able to kind of figure out that these people were all drunk um, when they, when they had drowned. And so that's another kind of, or when they had died at least. And so that's another kind of like alarming fact that I wouldn't have thought you could get after a body was in the water for that long. Um, right. There's skin slippage. I'm sorry. I said I wouldn't say that again. But <laughs> it's interesting, though. I really hadn't thought about um, like how like being in a body of water and then not washing away your prints. But I guess if your fingerprints are from your oils and like water doesn't like oil. Right. Oh, that's true, too. Yeah. I, I don't know. know. I'm just I'm having kind of like a mind blown experience here. But thank you yeah. for that fun fact. You're so welcome. And I don't know. I don't know how it pertains to fingerprints. But I do. I did learn that like your body, if it's submerged in water, doesn't get rid of, for example, like ligature marks or um, the drugs in your system, like those will still show up in a tox report and that kind of thing, mm. which you'd think like water would, I don't know, degrade that, I guess, but apparently does not. Well, now that we're friends with Morbid, we should ask Elena. She would probably know. That's true. I'm sure she would know. Um, So that is a myth. And so a waterlogged corpse can provide a variety of forensic evidence. Um, Another point is that the killings do not fit any known serial killer motive, psychologically speaking. So even though they said, like, oh, we believe it's envy, um, psychologists looked at this and said, like, we don't really – we can't match this to any known, you know, uh, psychological – motive like they just said it didn't fit like that didn't seem likely and then um you know the confessions by the correctional inmate who who said this was a uh, a murder a lot of times that can't be they've proven unreliable let's just put it that way sometimes they're coerced sometimes they're boastful sometimes they're just trying to get out of or trying to get you know some credit by pointing to someone in the outside and saying like, oh, this was a, cr- I know who did it, or I have information about this. If you'll give me something, you know, so a lot of times confessions aren't necessarily reliable. Right. And then another point is that the environment in the general areas of the disappearance were conducive to accidental drowning. So the areas in question where the bodies were found or where they entered the water were near bars and campuses. They were all downhill and they all lacked barriers. Okay. And so one thing I heard too about, uh, you know, well, why would they have, how would they have accidentally drowned? Well, one point I heard, which was interesting is like, maybe a dude had to pee and he walked toward the river and, you know, something like that. Yeah. That's actually a good point. Or like maybe just stumbling and like, if there's no barriers, it's quick to roll down. Just fall. Yeah. Just Yeah. And like, I mean... I could imagine like rolling all the way down, hitting your head and then your head's yes, up in the water. That's a good point. Trouble, you know, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. And like falling unconscious, maybe you're blackout, maybe you're, and a lot of these people were extremely intoxicated. Um, so, you know, that goes to the same point of like, maybe they weren't in control of their faculties and they fell or who knows, but they, all the areas were, yeah, lacking barriers downhill and near the bars and campuses where they were getting drunk. And, um, also, so, even if it was, like, let's say it was a homicide for all you know, like, there was just someone on the street that, like, I, yeah. I don't know, like, maybe there was one homicidal thing, but it didn't happen to be the smiley face gang or anything. It was, exactly. like, there was one time where someone actually did kill this person, but it's totally, like, now a different exactly. storyline. And those two, those two that were ruled homicides, like, that's what the people who doubt this theory believe, like, well, those two were homicides, sure, but they had no connection to Got it. All yeah. the other deaths, like maybe the one was a gang related murder. Maybe the other one was like a friend or, you know, someone who 
got into a fight with him and killed him or, or maybe someone like robbed them and like hit or robbed the head or something yeah. you know like yeah it's like a freak accident type thing yeah um so that's a, that's true too and the fact that so another point they made was that the fact that they're all males who are being killed does not necessarily support a serial killer theory uh, apparently males are simply more likely to drown or be hospitalized from near drowning than female statistically speaking and they're also are- more likely aren't they to like be like wildly drunk compared to women that actually says males are statistically in more likely to engage in more risky behavior than females and that's you know when 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 drunk i presume because you know i mean this is obviously anecdotal but you think like it's probably more likely that a dude would wander home by himself than like a group of young women or something saying yeah you right, go no, home by yourself like much much more rare of an instance as a woman after going to a bar, walking themselves like with home. friends, right? Exactly. Right. That and also exactly. don't. I think it's something like men metabolize alcohol differently, where they can drink a lot more, and so like it would make sense why they might actually be more intoxicated or something like right. that. So they might make it might only exacerbate their risky yeah. behavior. So. Yeah, exactly. And they were all really young. They were all like college age, um, and really yeah. popular, and out with their friends. And one of them was on right. Halloween. Like, I mean, it kind of is conducive to like binge shrinking um and so the one so lacrosse wisconsin where several of these were supposedly taking place um i think they said like eight of the victims they believed were from lacrosse or happened in lacrosse wisconsin so apparently in that town foot patrols and police have stopped over 50 intoxicated persons from approaching the river late at night Mm -hmm. so like Aside from people drowning, they've stopped at least 50 people from wandering toward the river at night drunkenly. So the fact that, you know, eight of them over 25 years or whatever right. died in the river, it's not that unreasonable if you're thinking this many people are just wandering drunkenly toward the river. Right. Okay. I see that. And one more point is the process by which intoxicated men accidentally fall in the river is already known and well documented. And it happens pretty often and doesn't always end in death. Um, most of these incidents are preceded by risky behavior and, uh, many of the drowning cases are likely to have involved aspects of auto assassination, which is not suicide, but is a style apparently of living with reckless disregard for one's own life. So you're not intentionally going out to end your own life, but you are living, you know, or behaving in such a way that like. Like a like you end the up um, like the adrenaline junkies out there. Yes, I don't know if like, that's right. probably not like, the right phrasing anymore. But like people who are like, you know, really get off on like that intense extreme thrill. danger. Exactly. And when you're drunk, you know, that might seem you lose your inhibition. That might seem more likely, more of a reasonable thing to do. You might feel jump more into, invincible than normal. Exactly. Like jump into a frozen river, or you know, who knows what it may be. Dive off a dock, whatever. But or maybe apparently- like people just want to get high by the river and then they just like fall over. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> that's me falling into a river. Like oh, I just. I mean, get I'm just thinking about like like my hometown. Like I don't know a person who didn't get high by the quarry at one point, especially yeah. if you're like out drinking with your buddies. You know, right. like and like you know, people try to show off and that kind of thing is documented and a lot of. Young men do fall into bodies of water when they're drunk. It's a statistic, you know, and <laughs> as sad as that is, uh, and not all of them die, but, you know, it doesn't shock me that some of them would, especially when it's freezing out. If you're of male experience and also <laughs> drinking, just avoid water. Please be just, careful. Is unless you're to say. drinking it to stop being drunk. If you're anyone near body of water, just be careful, please. Right. <laughs> um, so... I will also add that malicious drugging of the victims is not supported by the evidence. So even in some of the bodies, they did find GHB, which is um, known as a date rape drug. And they did find that present in the bloodstream. But apparently that also appears when the body decomposes as part of your natural decomp. So it's not necessarily supported that this was intentional drugging. Got it. And I will, this is the last point. The drowning of college students is not limited by region, but by climate. So desert states shockingly do not re- report as many drowning deaths for obvious reasons sure as other states and countries with similar like midwest and northeast clients clients jesus climates where there are bodies of water where you know it's freezing cold out that kind of right. thing um the investigators dismissed so the investigators back to them who like you know are proponents of this theory They dismissed the entire report and they continued on their search for the smiley face killer, believing that they would find more evidence to support their theory. 
And so um, in, by 2014, Peel, who was the, inv- she was the investigative reporter, as well as some of the, as well as some of the parents of the victims started to kind of move away from Gannon, Duarte and Gilbertson. They were like distancing themselves. Gotcha. And according to interviews in 2015 with Peel and, um, and parents, some of the parents of the victims by a critic named Ruben Rosario, he was a critic of the smiley face theory. Uh, they told the interviewer that Gannon was an opportunity opportunist who at least on one occasion tried to charge producers for T TV interviews with the parents of the victims. What? And they had no idea they were being exploited for monetary gain. And so he was trying Mm. to like make money apparently allegedly off of these interviews. Um, and so that was another thing that's like, that's iffy, um, right. Not a good sign. Not a good and look. Not a good look. Exactly. In 2015, uh, Peel, she no longer subscribed to this theory at all. However, she does believe that some of the accidental drownings were erroneously classified as accidental. And she helped started helping parents lobby police to reclassify the cases for investigation and try to look at the cases again and say, I really don't think my son drowned by accident. I believe this was a homicide. So she was helping, although she didn't believe in the smiley face theory anymore, she was starting to help parents kind of talk to police and reopen some of these cases okay. and then last year in 2019 oxygen produced a six-part series called smiley face killers the hunt for justice and this highlighted six of the cases that gannon duarte and gilbertson believed were associated with the smiley face killer gang and at the conclusion of the series one of the six cases had actually been reclassified as a homicide and is now oh, wow. under investigation so who knows? There's another one that's that's now considered There's a hope. murder as well. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> There's hope, right, uh, in the worst way possible. Yeah. Um, so the current theory, I'm just going to tell you what they now believe. Um, Gannon, Duarte, and Gilbertson all believe that across the Midwest and Northeast, predominantly in college towns, cells of connected serial killers abduct college-age young men, hold them for a period of time, and then murder them. The first victim was discovered in 97 and potential victims have been discovered as recently as 2019. So they believe this is ongoing. Um, They believe the victims are usually leaving a bar or a party alone, are more inebriated than normal, and perhaps have been drugged with GHB. They believe the victims are held captured, captive, excuse me, and even tortured for a while, perhaps driven around in a van, then killed and dumped in a body of water. And they are always found washed up on shores of rivers, creeks, ponds, and lakes. And they are discovered deceased after a period of missing that doesn't support the lack of decomp. So one of their one of their things they point to is that a lot of times when the bodies are found, they're like, this is not the the decomp of someone who's been in the water for two months or whatever it may be, or a month. They say like this body clearly wasn't dead for two months. This person died like a week ago. Um, so that's kind of one of those iffy things that people disagree on. But that they point to is like the decomp does not add up timeline wise as to when these people went missing. So that's kind of interesting too, where I'm like, that is kind of weird that like a body would not show a month of decomp. Right. I don't know. I can't figure that one out. Um, Also, they believe the killers seem to strike almost exclusively in winter months and they often leave a smiley face graffiti near where the bodies uh, have entered the water. They also believe that some of the symbols are also associated with the smiley face killer and police and investigators, they think overlook clues and medical examiners erroneously label cause of death as accidental drowning when it's actually a homicide. And they believe there are potentially 335 victims of this sophisticated network of serial killers. Wow. So that's what they stand by right now as it stands today. And I'm going to read now, kind of where I stand. Um, This is just the last bit of like, this is what makes the most sense to me. I mean, I don't, I haven't spoken to these people and I know a lot of people have talked to them and then changed their mind. So, you know, I could be wrong, but this is kind of where I stand after reading all this. Um, So the smiley face murder theory leaves a lot of questions unanswered. It contains a lot of inconsistencies. um, And it is true that uh, the investigations of Gannon, Duarte and Gilbertson did lead to reassessment. A lot of these cases that ended up actually being homicide. So they did do a lot of good in that way in that sure. they weren't all accidental, like they said. Um, it is unlikely to me that a like sinister operation of murder gang is going on for decades and uh, we just can't f- solve it or find the people involved. Right. 
Um, but it is likely that due to human error or other nuances that some of these deaths were not properly investigated by police or medical examiners, um, whether that's inadvertent or not, uh, you know, some of these have been flipped after a lot of pressure to become homicides. So I think, you know, maybe some of these cases weren't closely looked at. Um, some of the 30, 335 deaths could have also been the result of suicide or murder, um, right. though they in my opinion, would probably be more likely like what you said, like a one-off or maybe a personal uh, relationship with a killer sure. rather than like yeah. a sinister gang or just a freak accident type thing. Um, more than a few victims were in bar fights the night of their disappearances. So that's another another little tidbit. And at least one victim told his uncle in the days prior to his disappearance that he wanted to go to Florida to get away and start his life over. So even that is a little bit iffy and Interesting. points to something other than, you know, a big murder gang. Yeah. However, statistically, the vast majority were probably young men who had too much to drink, stumbled into the water, um, like apparently men tend to do, um, between parties and or bars or on their way home. And according to psychologists, the smiley face killer theory is kind of an answer, um, like a like a boogeyman or like something to blame um, for families and loved ones who just can't like, don't, this sounds awful. And I don't mean it this way at all, but because I understand it, but like, they don't want to believe that their son or their friend got so drunk that they wandered into the water, you know, they want an explanation or they're trying to find some reasoning behind it. Um, and so that I completely understand. And, you know, knowing now that like, uh, Gannon was, you know, paying or, or was getting money, to put the parents them and all yeah, that. Yeah. It's a little fishy to me. I mean, excuse the word, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I almost said it earlier and I kept saying iffy instead. And then I was like, shit, I slipped up. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I, and I think that makes a lot of sense that like, you know, parents don't want to believe that their, their child drowned or their friend or their brother right. or whoever uh, drowned by accident. That's just such a, yeah, they might want someone else to blame it on or yeah like an explanation um or some right. like boogeyman is what they called it um and so people close to a victim also naturally are shown to have a really hard time accepting suicide as an answer you know a lot of times you hear like they'd right. never do that um especially when they feel that pressure of like i didn't notice i didn't see any signs and that kind of thing right and it's and, like the the the, the survivor's guilt and the- yeah relationship guilt yeah exactly and so that was another thing they that the psychologists have pointed to is like maybe that's you know they're trying to find a reason for um a suicide yeah. they don't want to believe happened or or they can't believe happened um, or like if it if it were homicide then they at least have a chance of closure but yes if it's, exactly you know. like exactly rather than just looking at a freak accident or at themselves for not seeing signs or whatever it may be yeah right um so a definitive killer like would alleviate that guilt, that survivor's guilt, um, would, would put something tangible to blame, um, for a death, which is totally understandable. Um, so that's kind of where I stand, but I mean, who knows, like crazier things have happened. Like maybe this is one of those criminal minds episodes where there, where there's one detective being like, no, I know this is a pattern and, or SVU. And they're like, no, it's not. And then it turns out to be, maybe it is like that. And maybe we'll find more information. But as of today, Gannon Duarte and Gilbertson are still investigating the smiley face killer theory. And they, and the theory itself um, kind of straddles that line between urban legend and reality. So we don't totally know, but I mean, I kind of lean toward urban legend, but it is interesting um, to discuss either way. So that's the story. Morning glory. (laughs) <laughs> what's the word hummingbird i uh no i think you convinced me i'm kind of on on your side of it but it's weird because there are so many factors to it i yes, guess it, yeah it's really hard it's really hard to make my own um opinion though when like the police department can't even really figure it out like yeah and like i really hesitate as a podcaster to be like this is what i believe because again like right i've only I mean, read about it I literally was like making my own opinions earlier. I guess it's not so much about murder, but like a supernatural story, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, nobody take our opinions as fact, just like Please. a fun little oh, suggestion, <laughs> just, just our own theory. That's all. Yeah. But, it's um, like fun to discuss, but yeah, that's where I stand. I mean, I'm, I kind of with the, I think the second you said dog fur, I was like, Ugh. 
Yeah. Yeah. The second I said talking mongoose, I was kind of. <laughs> okay. All right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, I was on the ride for a little longer than I probably should have been. But <laughs> well, they reeled me back in with all those Gemini qualities. And I was like, you're right. I, That's what I love- got us. I love bacon and gossip and leaving after I'm done talking. <laughs> like, and like telling favorite. people to vanish out of my face when I'm done like, with them. <laughs> maybe we should just start signing off our podcast with vanish because that's when we're done talking. Okay. I was going to say, well, I was going to yell vanish at the end of the episode, but I guess you just spoiled my surprise. <laughs> we'll do in the, this time we'll do and that's why we vanish. Oh, okay. That'll work. Okay. Anyway. So thank you so much. If you guys want to follow us at all, um, our social medias are all ATWWD podcast. We also have patreon our website and that's why we drink.com um and, and our live also, show and our live show please if there are still tickets available we don't know right now how many people are we able no to clue. we're trying to make it as many people as possible like without having to do anything too crazy but um hopefully you can make it and that's it for us right and that's why we vanish, vanish. <laughs> okay <laughs>